in POS. At the very moment we enter the world, our bodies are defined by gender. It is the first question we ask about a baby. Is it a boy or is it a girl? Historically, the utmost importance has been placed on this perceived dichotomy. It is the basis of traditional Western notions of family, politics, culture and medicine, underpinning the patriarchal and normative societies that have dominated human history. Yet in the 21st century, advances in science and technology necessitate a reimagining of our physical boundaries. Our bodies have become sites for transformation, hybridization and magic. Our parts no longer belong to us. We are co-created and reimagined. Stem cell technology, personalized medicine, transplantation and augmentation compel us to ask, what is a human body? Can we define it and should we try? Over the past decade, I've been working on a series of pieces collectively titled Corpus, which aim to find alternative spaces of discourse for the human body. The first two parts, Ergo Sum and Et in Arcadia Ego, used stem cell research, genetic engineering and oncological technologies to place the body in between states, disrupting the site, mutating the contents and confronting im and mortality. These pieces used my own cells to decontextualize existing scientific processes in order to reveal their social and emotional meaning. In this, the third and final part of Corpus, I am collaborating with Professor Susanna Schuva de Souza Lopez in Leiden, Moo Gallery in Eindhoven and Kapolitsia Gallery Kursnikova Institute in Ljubljana to place my body at the intersection of sex and gender. The piece is called In Pos, and we are attempting to make semen from my female cells. Throughout history, semen has been revered as a magical substance, a totem of literal and symbolic potency. Patriarchal societies have described semen variously as life force, substance of the soul, a drop of the brain, divine and equal to 10 drops of blood. And my favorite, that which sows the seeds of virtue in the female soul. INPOS aims to rewrite this cultural narrative, to use art and science to disrupt the hierarchy. The project is being developed in three parts. Firstly, we are on a journey to grow spermatozoa, sperm cells, from my body. At the same time, we have developed a female form of seminal plasma, the fluid part of semen. Finally, we are reenacting the ancient Greek festival of Thesmophoria, a creative contextualization of the project. At the same time as I have been developing these strands of impos, I have fallen pregnant, experienced labor, and become a mother. This essay is, to some degree, an attempt to reconcile these experiences with the process of making the project. It is also a manifesto of sorts, a kind of theoretical autobiography or map of my thoughts, and a review of where the project stands creatively, scientifically, ethically, and personally. Sex. One of the first conversations I had with Susanna was about the impossibility of scientifically defining sex. As a bleeding heart liberal, I like to think that culture is usually one step ahead in terms of how we think about the human body. I like to think that it is artists and writers who are breaking taboos and pushing boundaries to redefine social norms and challenge perceived wisdom. I like to imagine us wearing moth-eaten velvet jackets and constructing metaphorical Molotov cocktails from half-drunk absinthe bottles lit with the end of a Galois cigarette. However, in terms of sex and gender at least, this is not the case, and scientists have been ahead of the game for some time. This is, in a roundabout way, how Susanna first described it to me. Let us imagine you are trying to create a system to definitively define sex. There are perhaps four indicators you might use. The physical body, the brain, the hormones and the chromosomes. Let us say I was assigned the female sex at birth and have subsequently identified as female throughout my life. In terms of the physical body, 
If I discovered that I did not have ovaries, I would not lose my sex. Equally, if, after puberty, I happened to be flat-chested, the medical profession would not find it necessary to reassign my sex. If, later in life, I undergo a hysterectomy, I would not be considered less female by any reasonable person. Secondly, let us say that I define myself as transgender. A little more than nine people in every 100,000 define themselves as transgender. That's, by my calculation, 27,690,000 people in the world, more than the population of Australia. The idea of a gendered brain has been thoroughly debunked by numerous scientific studies, and it would be wrong to diagnose me as mad, mistaken, or suffering from a neurological disease. Male, female, and non-binary brains have the same structure and, crucially, plasticity. Brains reflect the lives of their owners far more than their sex. It is important to acknowledge here that despite this, the transgender community continue to suffer prejudice and discrimination at the hands of the ignorant. Thirdly, in terms of hormones, there are many people who identify as female, myself included, who have higher levels of testosterone than the average male identifying person and vice versa. Furthermore, when I go through the menopause and stop producing oestrogen, I do not intend to reassign my sex, and I would be rightfully outraged if someone else suggested that I should. Finally, we come to the chromosomes, considered by many to be the last bastion of binary sex determination. But, yet again, here we find that things are far from clear. The water is muddy and opaque. When Susanna and I started in POS, one of the first things we did was check my chromosomes. And this is why. I could have been born with the opposite chromosomes to my phenotypical sex. This might mean that I had grown up with a penis and testicles, identifying as male, but later discovered that I have XX chromosomes. XX being the genetic marker of what we describe as genetically female, whilst XY is male. Equally, I could have a womb and ovaries, but discover that my chromosomes are, in fact, XY. So, the question Susanna posed to me was, where is sex? If our sex does not reside in the body, the brain, the blood or the DNA, where is it? What is it? The scientific process for making impulse draws on some of the examples above. It is also an attempt to illustrate the questions we are left with when we consider sex, to further contaminate the water and problematize the binary. A quick addendum here with regards to my romantic notion of artists leading the way in societal shifts with regards to sex and gender. When writing this essay, I sent it to Susanna to check the scientific content, which she did. However, what Susanna also did was school me in my use of gendered language and inclusive exclusionary grammar. In fact, Susanna and her lab are beginning to question if the term sex can even be used at all. Science. At the Leiden University Medical Centre, Susanna and her team are investigating how both eggs and sperm come from stem cells. For InPOS, Susanna is using human-induced pluripotent stem cells, HIPSCs, derived from my blood and skin to grow spermatozoa. These are the tadpole-like swimming cells you might imagine when thinking about sperm. Pluripotent stem cells have the ability to turn into any other type of cell in the body. So, in theory, if we can change the sex of my stem cells in some way, we should be able to differentiate them, to provide the right environment for them to transform, into sperm cells. My cells have XX chromosomes, the marker of what we describe as genetically female, whilst the male genome typically has XY chromosomes. Whilst it is possible for XX cells to undergo the first of many stages of transformation into sperm cells, we know from real-world examples of people who are born with the opposite chromosomes to their physical phenotypical sex that the presence of the second X renders them sterile. Therefore, the first stage of our project is to attempt to erase one of these Xs, or alternatively, to permanently deactivate it, to keep it silent. 
we will then attempt to grow a healthy colony of these mutated HIPSCs. The final stages will involve encouraging this colony to differentiate into the sperm-producing cells found in adult testicles. It is not yet fully understood how the body triggers the various transformations that occur on the road between stem cell and sperm cell. So we will need to discover the right environmental growth factors for ourselves. This might include adding an artificial SRI gene, that's S-R-Y, which is found on the Y chromosome. This process will teach us a huge amount about human fertility. At every point that our experiment stops working, one of the mechanisms by which sperm is made is revealed, and equally one of the ways in which people can be infertile is discovered. I believe that feminism is as beneficial to those identifying as men as it is to women, trans, non-binary people and all the rest of us. It gives me great satisfaction, therefore, that this overtly feminist project could help with what is commonly described as male infertility. Susanna has received the prestigious 1.5 million euro Vici grant to make this part of the project. She is also attempting to make eggs from XY stem cells. The grant is funding a team of five extraordinary and exceptional scientists over five years. The team has just completed the first year of this research, so there is still a long way to travel. The ones who walk, walk away, away from Omelas. Making sperm from female stem cells and eggs from male ones conjures a future in which same-sex couples could have their own children. As much as it is the journey by which we get there that interests me, it would be disingenuous not to admit that much of the appeal of Impos lies in this potential reality. To be a small part of that joy would be an immeasurable reward. However, the real world is messy and the ethics of these kind of paradigm shifts are rarely straightforward. Whether or not an embryo fertilised from a female sperm will be classed as genetically modified is going to depend on how we end up making it. The likelihood is that although the DNA may not bear any significant trace of modification, because the stem cells we are using will have been genetically modified, resulting potential embryos will also be considered as such. This poses some complex ethical questions, not least amongst them, do the massive potential advantages of genetically engineering human embryos outweigh the risks of altering the human germline, the genes that we pass on to our children and their children, etc, etc. In 2018, Hei Jiankui, who was an associate professor at the Department of Biology at the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, announced that the world's first genetically modified babies had been born, twin girls known as Lulu and Nana, who had been made resistant to HIV. This breakthrough was unilaterally condemned by the scientific community, primarily because Hei Jiankui had not received ethical approval to conduct his experiments and to bring these embryos to term. As things stand, gene editing is still experimental and can be associated with off-target mutations capable of triggering potential side effects later in Lulu and Nana's life. Lulu and Nana are not capable of consenting to this risk, nor is any genetically altered future baby, and this poses a difficult ethical question. Babies do not consent to being born with all manner of avoidable conditions, HIV not least amongst them and we do not stop people from having children in these circumstances. However, to many people it feels like a distinction can be made between the passing on of genetic conditions and diseases like HIV and the associated risks, however small, of genetic engineering. Furthermore, there is a fear of opening Pandora's box, of introducing genetic modifications to the human genome that cannot later be removed. On the other hand, Aside from the beautiful prospect of assisting same-sex couples in having their own children, genetic engineering has the potential to prevent pain and suffering for thousands, if not millions, of people. Can we, with a clear conscience, turn away from the chance to eradicate things like certain breast cancers and haemophilia in the short term 
and, hypothetically, things like childhood leukaemia, suicidal depression or multiple sclerosis in the future. At what point does the greater good outweigh the risks? And if science could reduce those risks, at what point would they be small enough to warrant the advantages? Ursula K. Le Guin wrote a short story in 1973 called The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. The story presents a thought experiment borrowing from Dostoevsky and William James. It describes a beautiful city of perpetual happiness, whose thousands of citizens' lives are full of joy and free from suffering. However, all of this requires that a single child be kept in a state of pain and isolation. Quote, They all know it is there, all the people of Omelas. Some of them have come to see it, others are content merely to know it is there. They all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies depend wholly on this child's abominable misery. In the story, whilst many are shocked and appalled when they learn of the child, most of the citizens of Omeles come to accept the price of their collective health and happiness. However, a very few walk away from the city. Quote, they leave Omelas, they walk ahead into the darkness, and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it, at all. It is possible that it does not exist, but they seem to know where they are going, the ones who walk away from Omelas. Come together. Inpos is about approaching semen as a symbol, one that has historically been used to solidify binary traditional notions of sex and gender, and metamorphosizing it so that it can be used to undermine patriarchal paradigms. The aesthetics of the symbol are important. When we think about how the semen symbol has been used to signify power structures, consider for example the ubiquitous come on face shot that crowns much pornography and the power relationship that is communicated by it, the physicality of the substance is conspicuous. Therefore, in order to use semen as a symbolic sculptural object, I needed to develop female seminal plasma as well as sperm cells. The seminal plasma, the goo, the slime, the gunk, the cum, was developed in Ljubljana at the Bio Tehenna Lab, which is part of Kapolitsia Gallery, Kursnikova Institute. We followed pre-existing published recipes for making artificial seminal plasma, of which there are many. These broadly involve mixing together proteins, fructose, lactic acid, and cellulose in specific quantities until you have something that is chemically and physically very similar to semen. However, there is one feature of these recipes that I wanted to change, the protein. All the papers we looked at used bovine plasma, which is derived from the blood of cows. I did not want the world's first female semen to also be cow semen, and so we decided to replace this substance with human blood plasma. In the Art Forum article Baroque Technopatriarchy Reproduction, Paul Preciado warns that the very survival of life on Earth depends on the invention of cooperative and symbiotic techniques of production and reproduction. The plasma for InPOS is donated by multiple women, trans and non-binary people from all over the world. Making the seminal fluid is a continuing collective act, a symbolic standing together in rejection of patriarchal hierarchy. By inviting many people to make semen with me, I draw on the tradition of collective making in feminist art practice, which rejects the idea of the singular, male, creative creator. Preciado goes on to ask, quote, What can we learn from our shared history? Can a new form of masculinity be defined in non-necropolitical terms? Is it possible to depatriarchalize and decolonize the institutions of family and nation state? Is there an equitable way to govern the use of reproductive fluids, semen, milk, blood, organs, uterus, cells, ovules, spermatozoids, and genetic materials? 
Is it possible to redistribute them or even collectivize them? We must apply the principle of cultural recombination to our strategies of producing and reproducing life, so as to transform our technologies of power and, politically, mutate. The Menace in Venice. In 2019, I exhibited in POS at the Venice Biennale. Whilst giving a talk about the installation, I was interrupted by a couple who, it transpired, were Catholics and objected to the piece on the grounds of their faith. Now, I should say here that half of my family are Catholics and I still get invited to Christmas dinner, so not all Catholics. Anyway, these particular Catholics escalated the discussion exponentially and I was quickly christened a menace at full volume as they exited the building. The menace in Venice. I have it on my business cards now. The gist of their somewhat rhetorical line of questioning could be boiled down to, so you want to get rid of all men. It's actually something that gets asked a lot just as much by leery uncles at weddings and unimaginative journalists as by the religious right wing. I find it a particularly depressing response to the project. The question assumes that the only value of men to women, please imagine inverted commas around these terms, is their reproductive role. It assumes that I and other women primarily regard our male identifying friends, lovers, partners, fathers, brothers, etc for their ability to sire children, and that without this function, we would have no need for them. They would be discarded, worthless. Now, women are used to being reduced to their reproductive utility, but less so men. Traditionally, even in religious communities, men are valued for their contribution to society, for their intellectual ability or physical prowess. They are valued for who they are, not who they make. It is therefore strange and sad to me that, in an effort to hang on to the gender binary, some elements of our culture are willing to reduce the infinite myriad of emotional, cultural, physical contributions male identifying people make to our lives down to whether or not they are needed to have children. It makes me wonder if there is an element of patriarchal guilt at play here. Perhaps the people asking this question, and so far it has only been people presenting as male, have been so shit to the women in their lives that they harbour an unconscious fear that, robbed of the one thing they can definitively do that women cannot, they would be summarily and enthusiastically dismissed. So, to answer the question, do you want to get rid of all men? Definitively, no. What my daughter has taught me. In POS and all my work over the past decade is broadly about enacting a transformation through collaborative practice. I have been seeking some kind of scientific transubstantiation, attempting to shift the context within which we view scientific advancement to reveal broad existential questions and to challenge pre-existing assumptions about human bodies. What has been a great surprise to me over the past year is how effectively pregnancy and birth does these things already. It is a dark testament to the distortive lens of pervasive patriarchal power structures that the pregnant female body is so ubiquitously used as a symbol of dichotomous gender roles, of heteronormativity and traditional stereotypical definitions of sex. I have been shocked by the embodied experience of pregnancy and specifically, as Maggie Nelson beautifully observes in The Argonauts, by what a queering experience it has been. My experience of pregnancy, labour and motherhood has been a palpable demonstration of the body's mutability. It has required me to inhabit the positions of being both binary and singular at the same time. I have possessed new and different body parts, multiple hearts, extra ovaries and a new brain. 
I have been forced to accommodate and love a parasite so that the boundary between myself and her was completely opaque. During labour, I was animal and God, the two of us existing somewhere between life and death. My brain has subsequently been hijacked by this new being. Some as yet dormant part of my mind took over and usurped my logical brain when we became two, so that at least for a couple of weeks I felt possessed, a body repurposed to serve another. If we talked about mutating bodies, hybridised beings, additional body parts, alien DNA, and the blurring of physical and genetic boundaries between individuals in the context of new science and technology, it would be seen as truly radical. Equally, if we developed methodologies for one individual to control the mental mechanisms of another, we would consider it profoundly dystopian. We would want to examine the existential implications of this kind of hypnosis. It is funny to me that, in the last couple of years, whilst myself and multiple collaborators have been working on IMPOS and expending huge amounts of time, money and energy on creating a transgressive, activistic, queer form of reproduction, my body managed it on its own in just nine months. In a recent panel discussion I took part in, I was asked why I think it is that we have, throughout our history, traditionally failed to philosophise, analyse or to learn from pregnancy and birth in this way? The simple answer is, of course, patriarchy. I think that, rather than theorising around its transformative, changing nature, writers, philosophers, doctors, etc. have discounted the female body because of its mutability. Preciado describes the archaic necropolitical power regime in which male bodies are superior, possess power over other bodies and can subject other bodies to violence, literal, social and cultural. Male bodies possessing of this power are thus historically the gold standard. It is Vitruvian man, not woman after all. One feature of the neutral male body in contrast to the female, trans or non-binary body is its comparative stability. We tend to consider bodies, or optimal bodies at least, as fixed. Their power, their maleness and neutrality, is derived from their stability. These bodies do not change. David is carved into marble, perfect and preserved. I would hypothesise that this preference for the constant body is also one reason why we have traditionally treated ageing bodies with such distaste. However, even if we fail to take the macro lived experience of over 50% of the population of the planet into account, far more once we consider the ageing body, new science and technology is once again forcing us to shift our perspective. Our understanding of bodies on a molecular and quantum level is distinctly liminal. Dipole charges attract or repel energy. The sensory system detects subtle differences in these dipoles and responds by literally moving the boundaries of objects within the body. We are in flux, our bodies constantly changing, adapting, responding, morphing and without stable borders. Quantum biology asks us, where does the body begin and end? Is there such a thing as a definable body? And are any organisms finite within a network of life? radical and optimistic. John Langshaw Austin wrote a book called How to Do Things with Words. In the book he describes a theory of speech acts or performative utterances. These are bits of language that have the power to do as well as describe or assert. To say them is to do them. For example, I promise or I take you as my lawful wedded wife. IMPOS has the lofty aspiration of being what we could describe as performative research. Research that is also an action, usually a social action. Performative research can affect a paradigm shift and change the context within which we consider ourselves, our bodies and our environment. Performative research provokes new philosophies and demands re-evaluation of social, cultural and economic norms. Austin describes the performative utterance as not truth valuable. He means that these bits of language cannot be judged by the extent to which they are true or false. When we say I promise, it is not a true or false statement like my vagina is pink, 
but instead it is simply an action. I see a link here to contemporary notions of process as practice in both art making and scientific research. For arguably the past half century or so, there has been an emphasis on process or methodology in arts education. Furthermore, many artists, myself included, are more interested in the making of the work than the end result and will often exhibit documentation and relics of these journeys in preference to what might be considered more polished and complicated final pieces. Similarly, and more contentiously in today's application-driven academic landscape, many of the scientists I work with would argue, quietly over a pint of beer, that it is the process of scientific research which is most important to them as opposed to the end results. They are arguing for fundamental research, the pursuit of knowledge without pre-specified useful applications, research in which the value is derived from the act of doing it and thus liberated from preconceived outcomes. For example, one might design a series of experiments to discover how memories are formed because it is intrinsically interesting and important to our understanding of the human condition rather than with the specific aim of curing Alzheimer's. Curing Alzheimer's might come as a result of the research, but this is not the aim in the first place. Like performative utterances, this kind of fundamental research does not succeed or fail, nor can it be true or false. And like art which focuses on the process by which it is made, the emphasis is not on an end result, but rather the value lies in what is learned through the research. The journey is all important. So, performative research is both fundamental in nature and process driven. It is neither true or false. Its value derives from the fact of its existence. It is not dichotomous, but rather it is transformative. It is a journey. It has the power to shift, to change, to evolve, resolve and reform. It is ultimately queer. Things that are queer also have the potential to be radical. In this way, what I am terming performative research, specifically art and or science, which changes something in society through its existence, is also a kind of activism. By going on these journeys, we are rejecting the status quo. We are protesting the past, taking control over our present and optimistically envisaging a future in which existing hierarchies have been undermined. We are fucking the patriarchy. Thesmophoria. The final part of the project, the way it is communicated, has been developed with Moo Hybrid Art House in Eindhoven. We wanted to find something messy, wet and joyful, to contrast the very anodyne lab aesthetic of much of this kind of art making with the gunky, chaotic, sticky ejaculation. It is also important to me that this project is as much about history as it is about the future. So, the form in POS is shared, performed and exhibited in is a reenactment and reimagining of the ancient Greek fertility festival of Thesmophoria. This is where myself and participating women, trans and non-binary people call the female semen into existence. The Thesmophoria was the largest festival in the whole of ancient Greece, both in terms of geographical area and longevity. However, virtually nothing is known about the original festival because it was women only. Men were forbidden from participating or knowing about the rites and rituals involved, and thus it was completely undocumented. What we do know is that it was dedicated to the fertility goddess Demeter, her daughter Persephone and also Hecate, the three in one, the daughter, the mother and the crone. Most accounts agree that there was a feast of seeds and the burial of a pig, which gets exhumed and used to fertilize the fields. Ritual obscenity, which sounds exciting, and serpentine phallic offerings also seem to have featured. We use our own female semen as a starting point for reimagining and resurrecting the Thesmophoria with multiple groups of women, trans and non-binary people at different sites across the world. The festivals are designed and executed by participants over a number of days. They build on the scant extant details and rumours about the Thesmophoria and create new collaborative rites and rituals around the donation of blood and associated laboratory protocols involved in making the project. 
All the festivals involve some kind of journey away from the site of normal life, often a trip into the wilderness or catabasis, journey to the underworld. Participants get to decide for themselves how much or little they wish to document and share with the public. This question of documentation is important. In the first instance, it speaks to the writing of history, specifically to the inherent limitations of restricting our appreciation and critique of the past to documentary techniques reliant upon deeply patriarchal power structures. The lived experience of women, trans, and non-binary people has been censored in art, literature, history, science, medicine, etc., etc. In the vast majority of human societies that populate the story of Homo sapiens, we are rarely written into the official narrative. The male experience is considered neutral, whilst the female, trans, and non-binary is niche. For example, most drugs are designed for and tested on men in part because the female hormone cycle is considered too irregular for the efficiency of many trials. Thus, women experience adverse drug reactions nearly twice as often as men. Equally, one would not, for example, make a point of mounting an exhibition of male painters of the 20th century. It would be absurd. Furthermore, art made about pregnancy, birth and motherhood has historically been considered at best soft and at worst irrelevant, narcissistic and uncritical. None of us are immune to this propaganda. Having spoken and written about how my own experience of motherhood has affected my practice, I now add to the litany of maternal anxieties the worry that my work is now tarnished with the damning brush of domesticity. So, to take the thesmophoria, this great mystery of female experience, the largest cultural expression of a society, ancient Greece, that we have, in the West at least, obsessed over and academicized arguably more than any other, and reclaim it, celebrate it, shamelessly crow about it, to write it back into our personal histories is intended to be a political statement, a kind of manifesto. On the flip side of this coin, there is a difference between being censored and censoring yourself. There has always been power in secrets, forbidden fruit. Patriarchal societies have used access to education, literacy, and the restriction of religious, political, scientific knowledge to control women, trans, and non-binary people since God told Eve not to eat the apple. So there is something empowering about the choice to withhold information, to keep it privileged. There has been so little in the world that men, as a group, have been forbidden from understanding. Yes, there are many things men have chosen not to concern themselves with, but comparatively so very little that they have been expressly prevented from knowing. This is something delicious, therefore, turning the table and keeping something between ourselves. The thesmophoria we have enacted have involved burials, tattoos, bodily fluids, burning effigies, ritual cleansing, singing, midnight processions, and a number of pigs in many different forms. The very first group to reenact the thesmophoria with me, however, decided that they only wanted to record audio of the climax of their festival in the dark forests of Slovenia. A discussion that has come up in multiple thesmophoria, usually after a few glasses of the ceremonial grape juice, goes something like this. Having examined the past and generally agreed that it would be a good idea to fuck the patriarchy, how can we draw into being the world that we want? The answer might be that we can imagine it, collectively. We can build it in our minds. Artists and scientists have a role to play here. In general, we are good at imagining possible futures and presenting them to our communities, be it through exhibition, concert or publication. Science, technology and art change the world. They present us with the possibility to change ourselves, our bodies, and our environment, and, crucially, to change the way we see ourselves, our bodies, and our environment. Science and art have the potential to give us faith that if we are lucky and determined, we can will new worlds into existence, through our choices, through discussion, through the way we vote, the people we love, the research we support, and the places we spend our money. Both science and art are exercises in world building. However, the real world, particularly at the moment, grinds you down. It is difficult to summon the energy. 
So perhaps another question we should be asking, particularly at this point in time, is how can we sustain these prayers? INPOS uses ritual as a device towards this aim. Rituals de- and recontextualize experience. They create a stage within which we perform, and in performing we historicize. This means looking at something as if it were an important detail of history, putting it in context, an invitation to think critically and to seek some kind of objective distance on our current reality. For example, when we make New Year's resolutions, we critique the previous year and resolve to make the next one better. We formulate literal strategies for creating a preferable future, and we do this optimistically every single year. I think Dickens was observing something profound in A Christmas Carol. He invokes for us something at the core of human rituals through the three ghosts, personifications of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come. Rituals bring together the past and the future in an observed present. We are acutely aware of time passing in the moment as we invoke the past and will possible futures into being. This is where I see ritual as having a role in an ethical science practice. We want scientists to be acutely aware of the mistakes of the past while considering the future they are helping to build. We want them to carry their ghosts on their shoulders and into the lab. Speaking of journeys, Fifteen years ago, I had just started art school. I had become a feminist, was drinking pints of Guinness with a shot of Tia Maria, and engaging in a lot of drunk, shouty arguments with my peers. At the same time, I was, nominally at least, doing a degree of art history at Edinburgh University. The first year was designed to be an introductory summary to the great movements in Western art. We considered artists from the Renaissance to the Romantics, the Realists to the Impressionists, we studied movements from Russia to Paris to Rome. There was even a brief foray into Islamic art and architecture. But within all this, not a single female artist was given more than a cursory mention. Poor old Mary Cassatt was momentarily wheeled out as an example of depictions of motherhood, dismissed as being indebted to Degas, and then swiftly put back in her box. I was angry and full of teenage indignation which came to a head when the course reached the abstract expressionists, the action painters. The narrative was so butch. These inheritors of impressionism were celebrated for their masculinity, and at their apex was Jackson Pollock, who by some accounts literally, and certainly figuratively, spent his career wanking over canvases. Pollock's technicolour drips and splashes were, and still are, described as ejaculations. Responding to all this, foaming at the mouth, I made a video called Painting Like a Genius. In the film, I strap on a fake penis, dip it in paint and use it to make fake pollocks. It was eventually exhibited in the art history department. This video is deeply embarrassing, as anything you make at art school should be. It is also very problematic. Why, for example, did I choose to wear stilettos and a little black dress? Surely I could have chosen a more nuanced soundtrack than the thumping 80s tunes heralded by Queen's I Want to Break Free, subtle Charlotte. But for all this cringe-inducing naivete, there is something satisfying about coming full circle. Coming full circle. In Pos is really an evolution of painting like a genius, a creative, scientific and personal evolution. I am now nearly twice as old, I have had a baby, a lot more orgasms, and seen milk squirt two metres from my nipple. In the past 15 years, conversations about the female body and female creativity have moved from the rarefied realms of academia and activism into the mass media. Stating you are a feminist is still just as politically loaded, but thankfully considerably more common. The concept of a gendered body is being continuously questioned and broken down by science and technology. And now Susanna and I can make our own real ejaculations onto canvas. Knowledge of this would have given me great satisfaction back at art school.
In pos is a Latin term with a literal meaning of before we are born. It refers to something which is possible, which has potential, but is yet to be called into existence. We are striving for a form of technological, biological and creative activism. IMPOS seeks to use art and science to undermine traditional notions of patriarchal power and to examine the meaning of sex and gender now and in the future.